name is Cheryl Valetta Trujillo. As I stated, and I am on faculty here in the School of Education, the College of Professional Studies, and we are broadcasting live from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. in the um, studios here at Cal State University, Dominguez Hills, and the DHTV. And we have the wonderful opportunity to offer our students, as well as our community, the opportunity to watch us live if you have um, cable, Time Warner cable, or we have the beauty of the internet. And on the internet, I have left explicit instructions for our uh, students, and enrolled students, to um, watch us under the new students icon. And also, um, as you do so, you can participate in the chat room as well as in the um, forums. And you can email me live with questions or discussion. And as part of the responsibilities for our class, you must participate. We do keep track. So I don't want you to be concerned if, you, uh, if you're if you emailing or if you have, for some reason, um, missed a live broadcast. You can always watch us on uh, the TV online archives from the dhtv.csudh.edu site. You can watch any of our previous broadcasts throughout the semester. So if you miss a concept or so, you're able through the beauty of technology to go back and um, reference one or more of the broadcasts that you may have missed throughout the semester. However, on our discussion board, I will ask that you make the contact um, and make a comment about something that you related to in our broadcast on the discussion board and to let me know that you've done so by the end of the semester because we do have a very, very large class size and I will definitely need to know that you have uh, participated with our class. And another important aspect in, in being able to participate is your telephone calls. Now, I can read your words, but if you speak your words, that adds such a dynamic to our class sessions each week. You can relay your, um, your feelings and your experiences in a much more valid way than just hearing my voice for two hours every single Sunday. So... When you call this number at the bottom of the screen, look at ourselves individually. And I'm hearing some feedback. So could we flash that number back up again? 1-800-339-1193. If you call that number and it's busy or you need to wait, please don't hang up. And when you do call and you get through, Turn your TV or your computer volume down so that we don't receive any feedback. It's very important that you do so because um, then the callers, the other callers or the viewers will not be able to hear you. And that's very important. So when I'm encouraging you, please call in. Please share your experiences because it adds a completely different dynamic to our class sessions each week. And community members, we invite you as well. We've been together through several of our semesters, and it's so good to be back in our student teachers and our interns who are working with our students in your community. We need to hear from you. The parents are such a vital component of parents and guardians. We uh, need you. You are our greatest resource. So without any further ado, I would like to um, just review some of the aspects of what we're going to 
going to be working with today. And in doing so, I'd like to start with a um, with some resources. I'm going to be giving you a variety of resources and um, and throughout the semester, and it's impossible for me to write all of these down and place them on the internet on your agendas each week I, that I post under the course document section. You will receive um, websites and articles that I post. However, I want to be uh, very specific about the fact that I, if you enjoy and see a resource that I have here, please write the name and the author down and I can record the ISBN number that I give you because it, I provide such a vast array of resources, it literally would be impossible to write all of them down for you. I'd like to start off with a poem about learning is great fun, and this comes from a book from a, 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 my mentor's husband, and she has since passed on. Unfortunately, but she deposited so much into my um, into motivating me and helping me be where I am today as an educator. It's called Poetry Treasures to Enhance Awareness and Build Self-Esteem by Edinburgh A. Norell Jr. And this is um, a collection of his original works, and he uses it to motivate young people and old, and old alike. So this poem is called Learning is Great Fun. When we come into this world, we come with a trusting heart. Our parents are our first teachers. They give us a big start. Then we learn from playmates how to be honest and fair, and that the greatest happiness is learning how to share. Then comes time for school. We're so eager. We, then our teacher gives us the good news. Learning is a game, which is great fun. We learn about citizenship and discover our potential to grow. Then we learn and practice skills. We learn about our country, about past heroes, and its history. The more we seem to learn, the less life seems in history. We learn to respect ourselves and give our respect to all. We learn that when we are selfish, we make our world so small. We learn to recognize our potential to be anything we want to be. We learn to dream and envision that we can shape our destiny. The whole process of learning is like a bright, shining sun, which reveals the magic of learning, that learning is great fun. And learning should be great fun. It isn't always as we know, and it is up to us to tap in to our students' prior knowledge and to help develop that into great fun. As we take a look into our course objectives and our student outcomes each week, as I go through the course content, I'm going to be giving you a list of objectives in accordance with the California Commission on Teacher Credentialing and in accordance to the NK, our national standards. And our teacher education program is very proud of the fact that we have both state and national accreditation. Our national accreditation for this course basically focuses on standard four, which is diversity. Today, we're going to begin to focus and reflect on our own cultural backgrounds and how this has had an influence on the way you view or interact with people from other focal groups. And then we're going to begin to reflect and explore your vision of who or what is a multicultural teacher. At the end of class today, I'm going to share with you uh, one of the reflective questions that I noted on the discussion board. And you're going to respond 
send that reflection directly on the discussion board for two of the ten participation points that you'll receive in the, during the uh, entire semester for, uh, for your past participation points. There is no right or wrong answer. You're going to want to include at least two to three paragraphs about what you feel a multicultural teacher entails, being a multicultural teacher entails. And um, the textbook that we're going to be using is this book right here. It's called Multicultural Education in a Pluralistic Society by Donna M. Goldick and Philip C. Chin. And this particular, this particular uh, book is, I did not, uh, I posted it so that you would be able to receive it and purchase it online. You, I gave you uh, two different ISBN numbers because you can, if you would like, choose to purchase the My Education Lab issue or not. It's not absolutely required. I would, I would suggest that you get that particular version. Uh, if you don't already have access to My Education Lab, it, as I said, it's not required to have that version. It is required to have the 8th edition. And in it, you will see that you have it, it, it automatically comes with the DVD that correlates to the various chapters that we have, and um, we have a lot of very current information in this book that covers aspects of multicultural education, dealing with the aspects of diversity in the 21st century, impact of multicultural education on teaching. It has what I love at the, uh, one of our uh, main aspects of our teacher ed pro uh, program is helping you to become reflective urban professionals. And within each of these chapters, you have reflective um, pauses, to, pauses to reflect and reflecting on the, uh, different aspects of the chapter. You also have aspects of having little scenarios that they, they will settle into these aspects. And you have different websites that you can access that suggest with articles or very current articles that are suggested. Another way that you can go to Amazon.com, any online books, um, it would be uh, to your benefit because for in this type of economy. And also, I am working with the publisher, Pearson, and I am in the process of uh, helping to organize and enable you to purchase the text as an e-text. And what this does is um, you can go to a course smart, and I'm going to be posting this this afternoon, or uh, once I get the, the, um, the okay from Pearson, and you can purchase a downloadable version of the text. And um, online, actually, the publisher is Alan and Bacon, which is a division of Pearson. And you can, uh, you'll be able to save money on the course material, get instant access to your assigned textbook, and purchase e textbooks with a 14 day money back guarantee. So, I, you, do, you will have some options as to how you would like to purchase that text. We do not have class next week because of Labor Day weekend, and so we will resume the following Saturday, Sunday. And so, therefore, you will not need your text until the weekend after Labor Day. Today, we're going to examine, as I said, our own cultural backgrounds. And in doing so, I'm going to 
share with you some of mine as well. As you look through the uh, syllabi that I've posted for you, I'm going to go through all of the aspects of that syllabus as we get to go through the, um, the um, text at the end on Blackboard, and we'll take a look at the responsibility.
myself. I define myself as a Chicana. Um, and then if I need to push out from that, I call myself a Latina. We're a, uh, a very committed Jewish family that's involved in our community. I am an African-American person, and I live my life as an African-American person. I'm, I'm Indian. But I'm Indian slash American. Being indigenous is, is basically being uh, from here. You know, uh, my roots are here. Definitely, my cultural identity is um, American. Just like you talk about Americans, I think the English are very close. French are very close. I define myself as Ghana. We're also Jamaican.
another caller. Jesus, you're calling from Carson. Good morning. I think it's in regards to your uh, question about how we view ourselves. Yes. Um, oh, Jesus, Jesus, do you have your TV on or your computer with the voice volume? No, I have it on mute. Okay, good. Because I had a little feedback there. Yeah, I heard it too. <laughs> American, but maybe by nationality. And if I would have to, I would, I would say, all right, I'm Mexican American. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I, I've been living here in, in Southern California for all my life. And my father actually, uh, when he immigrated over here from Mexico, he was living here in Carson when it was all like gardenian fields. There was nothing. <laughs> Your name, 
Alberti, is it Norbisi? It is Norbisi. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm calling in regarding the question um, uh, that you asked earlier. I'm sorry that I called once you started lecturing again. But I consider myself to be African American. Um, on one side of my family, my father's side, my father is African American and he's mixed with um, Blackfoot Indian American Indian. On my mom's side, uh, she's actually African American, uh, Caucasian, and Chickahominy Indian. And it's very, in, in my particular family, on my father's side, which is the front side we were raised with predominantly, I was pretty much the lightest, <laughs> the lightest grandchild um, there. So, in a sense, I sort of felt like a little bit of an outcast within my own family because on my yes. father's side, everyone was so much darker mm-hmm. than me. Um, to the point where, you know, there was a point when my grandmother questioned whether or not my father was really my father. That must have been very painful for you. Oh, yes, and I still remember it. And as you grow up, you sort of notice the, um, the difference in the way that you're treated. Yes. Even though I was the oldest grandchild, I always felt like my sister, who was born uh, a couple of years after me, who looked just like my father's side of the family down to the, you know, very light hazel eyes that um, that, they, that they have and mine are a little darker, but I just felt like she was more, she was considered more of the first grandchild than even, than even I was. So and, that was and, um, and we noticed this, I'm glad that you brought, that you brought this up because I'd like to ask others as well because sometimes, you know, in, in my family, on my mother's side, they were much lighter skinned Italians. And on my father's side, they were, on his father's side, they were lighter, but on his mother's side, they were dark skinned. And so when I was born, I was very light, but my sisters are dark. Right. And so, but my dad liked the dark skin. And they go outside. Everybody in my family, and they're they, they tan, and they're they're dark. Their hair is dark. Their skin is dark. My baby sister is dark. Twelve months out of the year, and my dad used to. They would. It was a big aggravation because unless they slathered me with sunscreen, I would get like second degree burns. And my dad used to sneer at me and say. I looked like the underbelly of a dead fish. <laughs> so, and it was considered kind of a not so, it made you feel awkward. You felt different. So, you never know until you walk in someone else's shoes. Right. How the misconceptions that we carry about other people. And so I'm so glad that you brought this up because there are so many divisions in families because of light skin, lighter skin, or darker skin. And um, I, I really appreciate you calling in and sharing that. And another thing that I appreciate is the fact that when you begin to go into, whether it's in teaching or especially in teaching, and you go down your class roster, in particular at the beginning of the school year, a child's name is a part of who they are. And it is disrespectful, and I have seen this occur, and I've had it happen to me, where people have mispronounced my last, my first name or my last name. It is a courtesy and part of who, the value that you're placing, whether you think anything about it or not, consciously or unconsciously, you're placing a value on who the child is by pronouncing the name properly. So if you are uncertain about the way that you are stating a child's name, or someone's name, out of respect, it's very important to ask if you are uncertain. So I thank you for for your phone call, and I hope that you continue to call in. I have a lot 
my email now from C. Borland and stating, I call myself Swedish, even though my mom is 100% Finnish and my dad is 50% Norwegian. But I was born and raised in Sweden. Thank you for that comment. And I want to remind you also that if you choose to remain anonymous, when you're sending me the email, I do see your email out of uh, your first uh, line at the top of the name, but in the, immediately when you write in the first sentence, please say, I choose to remain anonymous, and I will honor that. Okay. Chris states, I identify myself as American. I have adopted grandparents on both sides, so I don't know where the family originally came from. And there are sites, Ancestors.com, and there are DNA tests that you can take now. My friend, just, I spoke with her just this week, and she said she was so shocked because she took this, she got, she ordered this kit, and she did a, a swipe, and she sent it to the organization, and her family was from Mexico, and she thought, well, it would be traced probably back to Spain. Well, it was actually traced, her, her roots were from Italy and from Africa. So she was, um, she was very excited to find out the family, her family tree. This is from Snow, it's stating, my background is predominantly Irish Catholic. However, my paternal grandfather and his family came through the Ellis Island from the Ukraine and were Jewish. Um, my father's parents fought for 14 years over my dad's religious future with my mom taking him to church and my dad taking him to temple. He was baptized at 14. Okay, and I'd like to take the next caller, please. Kenya, you're calling from Carson. Good morning. Good morning. How uh, are you I'm today? I'm very good. How about yourself? Excellent. I love all of this interaction. I hope it continues throughout the semester. Yes, it's, it's actually a, a great question. Um, I, I was just thinking that as far as my culture, I, I really consider myself to be black. I, I know as a younger person, I always consider American, and I think as I started to really travel outside of the United States and see different things, I've come to the realization that even though I know my ancestors are African, and with you know slavery and the disconnect from that continent here, um, I think black, uh, more so people that I know, more I, our culture is kind of lost as far as that continent is concerned. Even when you go and you travel, um, I know that you know my nationality as far as where I was born is American, but there are also so many things when you just look at culture that that break right down to where I don't. Know really always feel American as that. So it's almost this, this feeling where you just feel me, you know, like, well, I'm, I'm black, and that's kind of like where, where, where it ends, um, because there's such this new culture that um, our, our um, descendants of Africans have created me here, regardless of the food, but where I hear um, a lot of our the, our dialects and things of that nature. So when I, I think of culture more so, or if I describe myself, I usually just say black. And I know it's painful as just being a, a younger person, because I was always on that. were born 
Mexican side as well as my American side, and I'm proud of both. And I have another phone call that I'd like to take. Joy, you're calling from Los Angeles. Good morning.
how to pronounce most of those names. Many of us have that difficulty with just the fact that you are asking and um, and it's just, it, it, it is very respectful to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And I have one last caller that I will take and I have a few more things to cover and we'll go to break. Yes, uh, caller, uh, at Marcia, thank you for waiting. You're calling from Inglewood. Oh, 
launched educational halls in curriculum that is dictated primarily by months or seasons of the year. Uh, we, a lot of us will so-called learn about culture in that way. For example, some teachers believe an appropriate time to study Native Americans is November, when Thanksgiving occurs in the United States. Elementary teachers do they take a detour during November and have children make Indian headbands or present a Thanksgiving play. Similarly, uh, Black History Month often is the only time children study African American leaders or read literature written by Black authors. Um, Maya Angela once remarked that she would be glad when Black History Month is no longer necessary. When all Americans are sufficiently a part of our courses of study and daily instruction, then there'll be no need to say the single out just 28 days out of the year and forget about it for the rest of the time. So these tour and detour methods trivialize patriotic and stereotype cultures by emphasizing only traditional foods, costumes, and dances while avoiding the true picture of the everyday life of the people from that culture. Again, with Dermot and Sparks stating that students often come away from such teaching with even more biases. Recently, some Caucasian students in one district checked out of school during a Black History Month program, and their parents indicated that they, they felt that the program wasn't for them. So, some ideas about what we could do is through books and materials that we have in our classroom on a regular, regular basis. And we can have, give these students the opportunity to learn first and learn about other cultures using pen mouse, for instance. And students can write journals or discuss similarities and differences. And some books that might be useful, children from Australia to Zimbabwe. Photographic Journey Around the World, Houses and Homes Around the World by Ann Morris, Ken Hayman, and Children Just Like Me by Susan Elizabeth Clopsy, Hands Around the World, and that is really great. It's 365 creative ways to encourage cultural awareness and global respect. Williamson's Kids Can series by Susan Milford. Celebrations Around the World, a multicultural handbook by Carol S. Angle. And uh, another children just like me in celebrations by Annabelle Kindersley and Barnabas Kindersley. And, you know, having objects around the room on a regular basis, such as different cloths from different cultures, and inviting parents to come in and to bring things. And when we come back from break, I'm going to share with you, and as we go to break, I'm going to ask you to take a look just in the immediate area where you're seated right now, and see if you can find three objects that represent your cultural self. Three objects. I found them, and I'm going to give you an example so you kind of know. If I'm sitting in my living room, I have a little, my grandmother's little seat that she gave to me. I have a photograph of four generations, and I have from my books a, a, a little doily, a crocheted doily from my great Thread. Another thing I have is a photograph from when I taught. It wasn't my last year of teaching either, but this is my, one of my classes that I taught school. It was Adams Elementary. Yay! Yeah, I was teaching. Okay, so those are things in my living room that that talk that reflect my cultural self and my background. 
my background. So I want you to do the same. And we're going to take a break, and I'm going to lead you uh, for 10 minutes. And while I do, you look for that. And before we go off, from Dan, he says, my name is Daniel Horvath. I was born and raised in Argentina. I came to the U.S. seven years ago. But even though the Argentinian culture is very different from the Mexican or, um, or Central American, I still have many things in common with the students, such as language, soccer, and fields, which goes back to the uh, uh, part of the 15 misconceptions, because we find commonalities, we find the differences and celebrate those, and we also focus on the commonalities. And with that, I so enjoyed this interaction, the first section of our class. We're going to take a brief pause, look for your three items, and come back on and share why some of those items are significant in your life. See you in just a few moments. University, Dominguez Hills. My name is Elaine, and I'm a retired teacher. And as a retired teacher, I wanted this time to learn new stuff. We had this time and an opportunity to explore things we were interested in doing that we hadn't been able to do during our years. I was enthralled by the large variety of people uh, of my age and experience that uh, from whom I could learn. It has been a tremendous way for us to focus in a very deep way on very different subjects. It's like a candy store of things that I've always wanted to uh, get into, uh, whereas for 40 years I worked at hard to pay no attention to some of the things. I was able to uh, go out here and explore many other subjects. I've learned about the Koran and I've learned about Christianity. I've learned about anthropology and I've learned about short stories. The amount of new things I can learn are absolutely enriching my life. Hi, my name is Monique McNeil. I'm currently attending California State University Dominguez Hills from West Los Angeles College. I chose to make a sales because I heard about the great facility and the great people. Thank you. 
Patrick Vega, who's a multiple from theater like the Maryland Wayne State Public Schools. And the program is designed to do play readings, workshops, and folk tale tours to local elementary schools, which we did every year. The idea is that we are not doing theater so much as an uh, entertainment, doing theater to help make our lives better. It is community service first and theater second. So, for instance, Patrick will do a play reading of a, a play about something that's in our culture, it's very Asian immigrants. And that may be performed in the middle school or here on campus. I remember many years ago, it's been a tradition that we used to come into our classrooms to, to read scenes. We had workshops where we would really put like a little flash in it or a little theater company to help our students learn more community based theater music. And the touring show is always interesting every year. We do folk tale and we create folk tales of our own, which is not a most of the masses. And we tour the local second grade classrooms. So, what Tasha does uh, is really an educational theater. It's theater that focuses on social issues and it has more of a direct purpose uh, for society. in San Diego, and my major is digital media arts and TV. I chose CSC Dominguez because I heard I had a very good TV program, and I liked it because it was just very hands on, and they seemed very nice, and it seemed like a very cool place to be. Enrich your life, increase your earning potential. Cal State Dominguez Sanders offers an industry degree in humanities. With a focus on the cities of the world, this master's degree will be learned in as little as five semesters. Evening classes are available for your convenience. Widely, call 310-243-3636. That's 310-243-3636. I took one of the distance learning classes uh, for convenience. Uh, it was nice to be at home in the mornings and, and watch it at home. Um, or you know, if it didn't work out that way, I could tape it and watch it in my own uh, leisure. Well, I took the distance learning course because it's, um, I'm able to watch videos anytime I want in my convenience. And it's easy to do now. You can watch it at home or either at the media center. And uh, I uh, would recommend this to a friend. Hello, my name is Thank you. 
of education in an urban context, and we had quite a busy first half an hour. We have less than, than an hour to go. Some of you have just joined us. I want to remind you this is a live broadcast. We are on until 11 a.m. Today is our first session of the semester. We are focusing on definitions of multicultural education. We are focusing in on the topic of uh, defining culture and multicultural and, and we've been discussing aspects of culture and how we define ourselves. And I shared with you a few clips and many of you were calling in that our 800 number that you just saw up on the screen. We're discussing some, uh, some aspects of multicultural ed and how they affect us personally because as we were talking about the importance of focusing on that, um, uh, the, the multicultural education from a personal perspective as a field of study according to banks to increase educational equality for all students that incorporates for this purpose content, concepts, principles, theories, and paradigms from history, the social and behavioral sciences, and particularly from ethnic studies and women's studies, and not only draws on those concepts and paradigms and theories from from interdisciplinary fields. It also um, challenges and reinterprets contents, um, concepts and paradigms from established disciplines, according to banks. And what we want to make certain that we do, and I was sharing with you before the break, was that as we begin to take a look at ourselves, we can then begin to examine the aspects of who we are and begin to, to, to take a look at our own bias and then in turn how that helps us to be able to begin to look at others in a more positive way and many times we can dispel the bias that we have and if, if we can't and at least we can put it in a place that it does not harm others. And with that, I believe we had a caller that was waiting online from before because when we left, we were discussing some aspects and I asked you to take a look around your home and to try to find something somewhere in your house just by sitting down where you were watching the TV and take a look at something that represented your cultural self that was right there by you and I wanted you to see and call in and share that. Now, in particular, I had these, and Perla talks about, I have an email from Perla and she says, I have a figure of the Virgin of Guadalupe, a horseshoe on the front entryway, and a blessed cross on the front door. I think that these items represent some of the beliefs in my family. Oh, in my culture, history, in America. So it's even hard for us to identify with each other within our own culture. And that was something from the mis uh, 15 misconceptions that talked about the, you know, similar, similar aspects that in our own, the cultures of, of um, Cuba, Mexico, Puerto Rico, Argentina are distinctly different from one another, and even though they share the same language, we have obvious differences. So that's very important to keep in mind. And uh, we want to focus on that aspect. We also want to make it clear that um, Rockstar here says that my name is Ryan Long. I have some of my father's artwork, and he takes random things that he finds 
Scottish walks and turns them into some of the most beautiful pieces of work. He um, has always been able to see the beauty in things that many other people would never be able to see. I think it represents me well because I also try to see the beauty in all aspects of life. I would love to see some of the pictures or see something like that. And you can do that because I have office hours on campus that I've listed in the syllabus. So if you um, ever want to stop by and let me see some of those, Ryan, I would more be, be more than happy to see those. And um, Shonda had stated that one of the items I found was a family tree. I started about three years ago. My family tree includes five generations, starting from my grandparents. On my mother's side of the family, I have over 78 first cousins, most of whom I do not know. And there are so many websites now that we can start our, where we can start our family tree. Ancestors.com is a wonderful site to go to if you would, if you uh, if you want to search for something like that. The three objects that identify my culture and ethnicity are religious artifacts of the Catholic Church, traditional artifacts from my home country, the Aztec calendar, and the various sports or athletic awards to include those for soccer. Thank you for sharing that. there now too. 
don't feel that I have assimilated. I don't feel like my sister has assimilated. But of course, we are American and South Asian, um, some hybrid in the middle. I wouldn't say that I'm American, but then I wouldn't say that I was South Asian. When I go to India, I feel just as out of place as I do when I'm here.
Italian upbringing, but we weren't taught certain things such as language. I mean, we learned a lot of language. When they were arguing with each other, they would talk in Italian. We just didn't realize how often they argued, so we picked up a lot of Italian that was uh, maybe not necessarily appropriate vocabulary. But um, this was amazing. This book is amazing. Chapter that talks about the treatment of Italians in the South and um, the fact that in the New Orleans area, uh, many Italians were lynched, and uh, when they went down to find work. Now, in all of the entire family, both sides of my family, there was one person who was a father and he was Irish and I, we didn't even know he wasn't Italian until way later in my life, in life. and so this, I have this book called The Irish State Civilization, we have a little story, so that's why we have those, and in your classroom you can always have, you know, magazines representing Hispanic magazines. This is an older version. This is from July of Ebony. I have uh, the new one, Michael Jackson, on the cover. Every September issue of Ebony has a um, college list and a list of, of um, uh, available scholarships. And this is the time to take a look at it and be aware of what's out there. Also, you know, wonderful pieces of literature in the classroom that re represent diversity. A river run wild. Harvesting hope. It's a calcum or a honor book. This is a campaign called Illustrated by Yuri Morales. So, here's one, Grandfather's Dream. And a book that I find especially useful, and this is a new text. It's called 50 Strategies for Communicating and Working with Diverse Families. And I'm going to be sharing some of these strategies with you. It's by Janet Osiris Nina. And the ISBN number on that is um, 13 7-0-0-2-3-1-3 and I'd like to hear from more of you regarding the items that you found in your, in your closet there. Another aspect of what we need to know as educators is it's very important at the beginning of the school year or periodically throughout the year, back to school night and in your, um, your conferences is not enough time to, or, or, or effort to make communication with parents. You should ask for volunteers. You should send emails. You should send notes with uh, student work announcements and things like that, um, phone calls, positive phone calls, home, um, you know, contests, anything that you can do to go the extra mile, because if your parents realize the efforts that you're making, your 
each sight concealed, except what you have and all that is freely given. Strive to be greater than you were before. Ask and even your smallest wish will be granted. Dream of what you can be, a world of peace and beauty for all to share. And that's by Stephanie Robinson. That is my goal for all of us this semester, is to be able to have a circle, to be able to develop a circle of unity involving children, adults, teachers, educators, that promote diversity, and that help to teach children how to respectfully respond to teaching and learning and involve the parents as much as we possibly can encourage the parents. Many times parents don't participate because they don't know how or they haven't been encouraged to participate in the past. So as we move to uh, Blackboard, I just wanted to uh, make certain understand why we focused on discussing aspects of self, and we're going to continue that into our next session as well. We began to focus on and reflect on our cultural selves, and, and how on the blackboard, oh, and here we say good morning, I like to read this last one. Good morning, my name is Mondwine Poole, the first of my cultural optics is a miniature wood piece, a uh, wooden replica of a Castillo and Chichen Itza, Mexico. It represents my indigenous Mayan background. And my second cultural object is a um, John Coltrane LD album. As an angelino, I have been exposed to other things not Mexican that I have great affinity to. My third object is a Fernando Valenzuela view baseball card. It represents the fact that people of different nationalities can flourish and be successful in the United States. Thank you for sharing that. And let's take a look at Blackboard so you know what we're doing and where. I will leave you a, an email and a, um, I will actually email you an announcement every week and post the announcement here on Blackboard as I did this week and you'll find that here. Then under the course information, I mean the course documents, you can find the syllabus. This is pretty explanatory and it's pretty much in depth. And again, I encourage everyone to keep my favorite F word in mind flexibility. I promise to cover all course objectives. And the agendas are also located here. You'll find an individual folder for each one, and the websites that we cover are also available uh, on, on there. And I have posted some articles for you here as well that are both um, for session one and for session two, the weekend after Labor Day. The scope of multicultural education, the power of parents, and 15 misconceptions about uh, multicultural education. And if you go to course, uh, to the assignment section, assignment number one is the parent community interview. It will be due on September 20th. You will not submit any, and I repeat, any emails to me. You will submit all of your assignments on Blackboard to a link that will become available as we near the submission date. And you will not submit anything as a um, Vista or as a uh, WordPerfect document, only as an RTF or 
as a Word document will be acceptable. You have a you have a um, discussion board here assignment. What is multicultural? What is a multicultural teacher? And when we return by next time, you should all post that there for your two points extra credit. Now what I'd like to do for the last few moments is have you listen to the Black Eyed Peas, Where is the Love? Thank you so much. You gave a lot of love calling in and sending your emails live. This is Cheryl Levin Trujillo, and I will see you.